Lord, thank you for this time we've had of coming into your presence with uh, singing and music and Lord, to be able to sing the praises of our marvelous Redeemer. What a privilege. Lord, thank you for that fountain that is filled with blood that has cleansed us. What a marvelous thought. And Lord, thank you for a time of prayer where we can quiet our hearts and our souls before you. We can lift up the needs of others and we can listen for that still, small voice. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray as we look at it today, you would bring life. Lord, we're all in different places. We all have so many different needs and so many things that so easily distract. But Lord, would you please speak to our hearts today through your spirit, through your word. Thank you for it. Amen. We've been working our way through Isaiah here and there in Isaiah 38 and 39, 37, 38, 39, tell this story of Hezekiah and his battle with the king of Assyria, his victory, even his sickness, eventual death, and so forth. And I was thinking, it's too bad Diane's not here today because I love when she sends out emails. She'll send out emails sometimes about somebody's prayer need, and she'll put male version. Somebody's sick, they've got this, they need prayer female version, and then it'll be like, you know, all the details. They went to the doctor, they got this, this is what they're doing, you know. And I like that because in a lot of ways, that's what's going on in these various uh, recordings of this event that's in three different places in Scripture. For example, in the Second Chronicles version, we get the abbreviated version of what we're going to cover in Isaiah today, and I just want you to catch the flavor of it. It says, in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he answered him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was proud. Therefore wrath came upon him in Judah and Jerusalem. But Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon him in the days of Hezekiah. That's three verses. What's expanded in Isaiah is a lot longer than that. And so you kind of get the cliff notes. Here's where we're going. And then we're going to go back and look at the actual details through Isaiah, because that's where we're uh, spending our time. And Isaiah was around 39 years old when uh, he gets this. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die. You shall not recover. Many argue over when this took place. Did it take place before the events in the previous chapter about Assyria and 185,000 of the Assyrians being killed, or did it take place afterwards? And my question, when they debate about those things, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It doesn't make any difference to me. I don't think it has a lot of difference one way or the other, but I'll show you why they fuss about it. But he's 39 years old. The throne of David is going to be empty at this point because he doesn't have an heir, and that's a big deal in those days. It's a huge deal to a king. Dying early and being sonless is a sure sign of God's displeasure, according to them. And the Hebrew, for when he says, you shall die, basically as he walks in and he says, you are a dead man. Nice. Set your house in order. You're the king, and the kingdom is going to go into chaos because you're going to die and there's nobody to take over. Not a good message. Sometimes people say, I really want to be a prophet. Be careful in how you pray. In those days, kings had life and death authority, and they could, if they didn't like what you said, you could lose your head. Matter of fact, the, the Jewish historians in the Talmud and other places say that Isaiah went into Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, and didn't like what was said, and so he had him sawn in two, who is who he's referred to in Hebrews there. It's kind of the Jewish history. So Isaiah's bringing a message to the king that says, you're a dead man, get your house in order. Not a good message. Uh, This particular chapter is dealing with Hezekiah and how he dealt with it. And one of the things that stuck out with me is that uh, whatever the time frame, before, after, or during the invasion, just because he was a king and just because he was faithful and just because he did good things and just because he restored temple worship and all of that doesn't mean that his life was smooth. In fact, he's 39 years old. The prophet comes to him and says, hey, God just told me you're going to die. In those days as well, so much uh, under the old covenant, what made somebody right with God was how they performed, what they did, 
Hezekiah, we know in the next verse, is going to turn his face to the wall and he's going to pray to the Lord, said, God, please remember me how I've walked before you in faithfulness with a whole heart and I've done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. You'll see this throughout the Old Testament. You'll see Nehemiah when he's trying to rebuild the wall and he's you know, getting so mad at guys he's pulling their beards and hair out because of their sin and stuff. And he'll say, God, remember me what I've done. You know, and this is what Hezekiah is doing. He's like, God, I did all that. I got the Passover back. I kicked out all the idols. I did all this stuff. I've restored temple worship. And now you're telling me I'm a dead man. I don't even have a son. What kind of deal is this, Lord? And David would often do that. Another thing that I noticed about this as you go through, and we tend not to think about it much because we're men and we're Americans, but kings, particularly in those days, were not afraid to show emotion. It says he turned and wept bitterly, sobbed loudly. There wasn't anybody around who didn't know this guy was upset. You know, we tend to want to be the, I don't want to show emotion sort of thing. These guys wailed, and they wailed loudly. You know, David danced with all of his might. Ahab, if you read about it, was pouting because he couldn't steal this one guy's garden and, you know, just bawling like a baby. They did that sort of thing back then. Praise God, we live under the new covenant. It doesn't have anything to do with the emotions, but it has everything to do with our righteousness. Our righteousness is in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And I don't have to go before God and say, God, remember what I did. Don't judge me because of this, that, and the other. I'm righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's good news. Our merit is in him. Now, our behavior is expected to be in accordance with our salvation. And we're expected to, be, to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. I'm not disclaiming that. But my righteousness is in Jesus Christ. My life is to now be dominated by the spirit, not the flesh, and so forth. So there's a distinction there. The king went to God, which is also a good place to go. He turned to the Lord, he put his face against the wall, and he's crying out to God. It's interesting, in the other versions or the other explanations of this in Chronicles and Kings, you'll see where Hezekiah didn't get very far. He got to about the middle of the court. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Hezekiah, go and say, or the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, and I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. Interesting. God answered that prayer and he answered it quickly. And I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. And so he throws in this extra thing. And this is what causes people problems about when this event took place. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. We just went through this whole situation where the king of Assyria was threatening him and all that, and then he left, and 185,000 people were killed and so forth. And so people are arguing, saying this happened before that. Some people say it happened during that. Some people say, well, he's talking about the fact that um, Assyria is still out there. They're a wounded enemy, but they're still an enemy. And we'll see in a little bit that they do come back and cause some serious damage in the next generation. So whatever the time frame was, God said, I'm going to protect you. And that's good news. It's interesting, if you want an exercise in fun, trying to see how people who do not believe in miracles explain things, get a few commentaries and read this passage. It says, this shall be a sign for you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has promised. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz, turn back ten steps. So the sun turned back on the dial, the ten steps by which it had declined. They're not exactly sure what that was. Apparently it's how they were telling time, but the shadow would move down the stairs. And he says, what do you want me to do? Well, you know, it's similar to the, to the other story. Anybody can make, make, make it go forward, make it go backwards. And so it happens. And, it, and it's fun to read uh, how people will try to explain this. I read it and I say, God did a miracle. I'm not sure exactly how he did it, but he, but he did that. Other people will read it and say, no, it's, it's just the way the light happened. The guy's eyes were cloudy and blah, blah, blah. You know, and you're going, Really? So, by way of a little detour, when you're studying on your own and when you're reading commentaries, make sure you understand where they're coming from. You need to understand the presuppositions that these writers have. Everybody has them. All of us who write and everybody who produces these sort of things have a a direction they're coming from. And if they don't believe that God still intervenes in the world today, if they don't believe God can do the miraculous, then their explanations are going to be clouded with that. You know, we, we laugh about, you know, the, the Red Sea. Obviously, what God did with the Red Sea and the army passing through there is that it was just a drought time and the water was only two inches deep. And that's how they got through. And, of course, the common response to that is, that's even a bigger miracle because the entire army drowned in two inches of water. <laughs> you know, so make sure you understand where they're coming from in these passages and what they're writing. That's just an oh, by the way. I believe God did a miracle. I don't know how he did it, but I believe he did it. 
And 9 through 20 is basically a psalm written by Hezekiah. He's talking about the advantages of being alive over dead. And I'm not going to go through all that today, though I would recommend it to you. But the reality is Hezekiah got a 15-year reprieve from the Lord. And he said, you're going to get 15 more years in your life. So Hezekiah still knew he was going to die. He just had a time frame. He has a better time frame than most of us. Most of us don't know that 15 years we're going to die. Hezekiah at least did. And so when you're reading that, keep that in the back of your mind. I'm not going to cover that today. Uh, what, what I am going to get to, and, and this was just kind of an oh, by the way, that I thought was interesting. Think about what just happened. The sundial just changed. There was this miracle that took place. Hezekiah has got something that he's dying from. And as I, Isaiah tells him, well, take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil, and he'll recover. And I'm going, what? What is that? You know, he, he's using alternative medicine or something, you know, to heal him. Why didn't he just wave his hand over it or why didn't he speak to it? I mean, this miracle just happened. But you know what? God can do whatever he wants to do. And he can do it however he wants to do. And if you're in here today and you're dealing with some kind of a physical issue, God may miraculously heal you. I believe God still does that. God may lead you to go to a doctor and get medicine that helps. I believe God does that as well. And I see this where I'm going, he's using the medicine of their day to heal something after God just did a phenomenal miracle. Interesting, that's an oh by the way as well, but when I read through these chapters, and this is where I want to go today and spend a little bit of time with us thinking about, is that I've got some theological questions here. I've got some issues with what has just taken place. There's some things that really bother me, and, and you know what? I'm okay with that. It doesn't bother me to read the scripture and go, now wait a minute, what is happening here? And I don't think it bothers God either. And so maybe you've had some of these questions, maybe you haven't, but I've, I've, I have some questions. For example, we read in Hezekiah, about Hezekiah in chapter 37, where Isaiah's response to him from the throne of God says, because you prayed, I'm going to do this. So my question is, well, what if Hezekiah hadn't prayed? What if he didn't pray? What would have happened? What would God have done? What if Hezekiah didn't turn his face to the wall and say, God, remember what I've done. Save me. Heal me. What would have happened? Now, of course, we don't know, but I've got a confession to make. I do not fully, that's even too strong of a word, I do not understand how prayer works. I don't get it a lot of times. I know what the scripture says. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as in its working. And he says, Elijah was a man just like you and I were, and he prayed and it didn't rain for three years, and then he prayed again and it, and it did rain and so forth. And I read that and I'm going, okay, there's obviously power in prayer, but I don't get it a lot of times. I've prayed for things sometimes and, and been saved a long time, and I've prayed since I got saved, and they still haven't happened. Am I wasting my time? Am I doing it wrong? Is something not happening? Why is God not listening to me? Why does Hezekiah turn to the wall and pray, and God tells Isaiah to go back when he's only you know, 20 feet away from him or whatever, and answers, and other times you pray, and there's no answer? Why? What if Hezekiah had not prayed here? Would God still have done something? I think that's a legitimate question. I don't know if we'll get the answer, but I think it's a legitimate question. Did Isaiah miss it when he told the king he was a dead man? Think how Isaiah must have felt. <laughs> he gets a word from the Lord. I want you to go to King Hezekiah. I want you to march in there. He's sick. He's laying on his bed. I want you to walk up to him, and I want you to tell him, you're a dead man. Get your house in order. You're not going to recover. And then I want you to leave. So he turns around and leaves. He gets just a few feet away or yards away or whatever, and God says, now I want you to go back and tell them that I've changed my mind. How do you think Isaiah felt? Do you think it was an issue for Isaiah? Do you think Isaiah knew ahead of time? I'm going to go in and give this word, and, and, and it's true or not true. I, I mean, really, Lord? Are you kidding me? I just went in there. I told the guy. I risked my life, and now I've got to go back and tell him what? I missed it? Do you think he struggled with that? Have you ever had anything like that happen in your life? I have. Numerous times. Just a thought. Did Isaiah miss it? No, I think he was walking in obedience to the Lord. And I think he did what God asked him to do. Was Isaiah looking like a fool when he went back? Not in Hezekiah's eyes. <laughs> he got a good word from him. 
Maybe you take that a step further and say, did God not know Hezekiah would cry out to him? Did God change his mind? Did God change his mind here? If Hezekiah wouldn't have cried out, would he have died? God says, put your house in order. You're going to die. He prays. Did God not know he was going to pray? These are some issues, aren't they? Is it just me thinking about this? I think about this kind of stuff when I read the scripture and go, what's going on here, Lord? What is happening? God knows everything. Did he not know that Hezekiah was going to cry out? He sent Isaiah in there. What was he doing? Well, some of the commentaries deal with this in, in a way that I certainly would agree with. Here's one of them. Prophecies were often threats. And when such were conditional, announcing results which would follow unless averted by prayer or repentance. And he throws in Jonah. Jonah goes there, says, within 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Yeah. <laughs> well, they repented. God said, okay, I'm not going to overthrow you. What was that? Similar type deal. Hezekiah, put your house in order. You're going to die. God, please remember me. Don't let me die. I don't want to die. Okay, I'm going to heal you. You got 15 more years. Did God not know that? Or was God after something else? Was God after a heart issue? We don't exactly know, but it's interesting to me anyway that that happened. It's at least something i got to think about. How does prayer fit into that? I don't know, but I know I want to pray, and I want to ask God for the things that are on my heart. Yeah. I have even more questions. Manasseh was 12 when he became king. Now, I'm not a son of a math expert or a math expert in any way, shape, or form, but Hezekiah was given 15 more years. He didn't have a son at that point, so he ends up having Manasseh. Do you know who Manasseh ended up being? Have you ever read about the life of Manasseh? Have you ever studied out this guy? This guy was a disaster. It says of him that he led the nation into more sin than any previous king. He filled the nation with blood from one end to the other. This is not a nice man. This is not a nice guy. So obviously you're going, well, did God make a mistake? I actually read one commentator who said, yeah, God blew it. I'm going, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me go back and see where you come from, dude. <laughs> did, did God make a mistake here? I mean, have you had those thoughts? I've, I've always had those thoughts about Manasseh as I'm reading through this. I'm going, man, it would have been better, Hezekiah, if you died and didn't have a son because he was a wreck. But is that accurate? Is that true? Do you guys think like this, or is this just me? Yeah, okay, I see two people that are, are still with me. Yes. <laughs> The rest of you, you're getting insight into a scary place, my mind. What happened here? Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. What do you see in there? You read something like that. This is a, a, a nugget description of Manasseh. What do you see there? He's Hezekiah's son that was given after he was given a reprieve of 15 years, and, and he does this. I look at that and I'm going, that Manasseh was a horrible person, but we're missing somebody in this verse if we stop there, aren't we? Maybe you haven't thought about this, but Manasseh led the people into doing these things. These are the same people that Hezekiah had led into tearing down Baal worship and restoring the Passover and walking with God to some measure or another, and yet the son comes along and he says he led him right back into the sin even more so. What does that speak of the people and their walk with God? Are, are, are we that easily led into deception and immorality and sin and murder and all the things that that Manasseh was responsible for. Were sin and rebellion still in the heart of the people? You know, they had an option. They didn't have to embrace the things that, that Manasseh restored that Hezekiah had wiped out, don't you think? You have a responsibility as a believer to not blindly accept everything that's put in front of you. You do. I'm not purposely ever trying to teach error but if I ever do teach error something that goes against the scripture you have a responsibility to not go there and God will deal with me because of a teacher and you incur stricter judgment but guess what you're responsible 
these people were responsible. What does, he, what does he say? The Lord spoke to Manasseh, and that turkey didn't pay any attention. Is that what it says? That, that's, you know, translation. But doesn't he also say, and to his people, <laughs> there were prophets, there were men of God, women of God, I'm sure, that were saying, this is not right, and they didn't listen. So we can get upset with Manasseh, but don't the people have a responsibility here as well? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's my point there. It gets really small here, but he goes on, he says, Therefore the Lord brought upon them, including Manasseh and the people, the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, they're still out there, who captured Manasseh with hooks, that's nice, and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. Assyria owned Babylon at this point. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the, Lord, the, his, before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and did what? Brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Wow, what a glorious God we serve. <laughs> if you study Manasseh at all, this guy was horrible. And yet... Under judgment of God, he cries out, not of his own volition even at this point. He's been led away in chains and hooks and whatever that means into captivity. And then he turns to God. And God says, I accept that. Wow, what gracious heavenly father do we serve? Does it hit you like it hits me? I don't care what you're like in here today. I don't care how far... You've fallen or I've fallen. If I turn to God, he does this kind of thing. He loves me. He forgives me. He, he, he restarts. It doesn't mean there aren't consequences. Think about where Manasseh was. Those scars of being hooks put in him were there till he died. He had been humiliated and lost his throne and all the things that went along with it. But God heard his cry and restored him. Man, what are you like today? What am I like today? Are you in here today? And I know some of you struggle with this. I've fallen so far, God can't save me. Really? What do you base that on? Look at Manasseh. If, nothing, if you don't get anything else out of today, look at Manasseh. He humbled himself. He repented. And God heard it. <laughs> and God restored him. Man, that gives me great hope. Maybe God was after something else in this whole endeavor, something that, that we couldn't just see in the circumstances of their lives. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, God does know everything and he's got everything under control. How about that as an option? And though Isaiah didn't see it or Hezekiah didn't see it or Manasseh didn't see it, God Almighty was working in ways totally unseen. He had to deal with the sin in the people. Captivity was a good way to do that. <laughs> Wow, just a thought. I have one more question. Hezekiah and Manasseh cried out to God while facing death. What's our view of death today? <laughs> well, that's rather morbid, is it? <laughs> I mean, none of us get out of here alive, this thing called life. Unless the Lord comes back and, you know, I'm all for that, by the way, but... Their perspective was to cry out to God. Get your house in order, Isaiah said, because you're going to die. What a word of the Lord for all of us. Are you in order today? Is your life in order? Is your house in order? Is your faith in order? Are you in order? <laughs> Not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but if the Lord doesn't come back, we are all going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> Do we have to fear that? No. God's in control. God's on the throne. What's your view of death? Here, here's mine. Paul sums it up really well. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is, your, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death has been defeated. <laughs> Completely defeated. Jesus Christ holds the keys to life and death. If a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without our Heavenly Father knowing it, do you think our lives are worth more than a sparrow? Isn't that what he said? What are you facing in here today? 
Many of us in here are, are the sandwich generation, they call it, where you, you still have parents that are aging, you've got kids in the home, and, and you know, you're still trying to do both, both ends. The reality is we are all going to walk through this thing called death. What's your view? Is death something to be feared, be, be afraid of, be tormented by now? Or is it, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? There's a, there's a glorious life ahead for those of us who know Jesus. It is beyond what we can even think or ask or imagine. I hope that's your view. I often state we need to have an eternal perspective as we walk through this temporal world. We must or we will be defeated. So let me ask you just a few more questions as we close here. How do you handle unanswerable questions? Can you handle those? What do you do with it? Does it shake your faith when you can't answer something? Or do you go, God, if it's really important for me to know this, I guess you can show it to me. Give me an explanation that I, that, that I need here. There, of course there's things that I don't understand. Many things. But I know my Father. I know my Heavenly Father. And He is good. And He loves me. And if I need to understand these things in greater detail, as I seek Him, He gives me more insight and wisdom. He'll do the same for you if you ask Him. But don't let that kind of stuff you know, paralyze you. God is moved by prayer and repentance. So the logical question to me is, will we do that? <laughs> if you're in here today and you're trapped in some kind of a sin, there is a way out. It's a very clearly marked path. It's called repentance and humility and go the other direction. It's very clear how we do that. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will we do that? Will we do it? God is moved by prayer, apparently, from what the scripture seems to say. Will we pray? Will we bring our requests known to God? I don't know how it all works, but I want to pray. God, I, I want to remind you of these things. I want to bring this before your throne again. Do what you want to do, how you want to do it. But Lord, may I leave it there and not carry it myself. Will we pray? And, and finally, if you're in here today and you don't know the Lord, your house is not in order. Young or old. You know, death is not limited to old people, though most of us get there. Death, we're not guaranteed another moment. When the scripture says things like, now is the acceptable time, it's because it's true. We're not guaranteed anything. Are you ready to meet Jesus? I mean, that's a good question, isn't it? Are you ready? Is your house in order? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Now, I've got excellent news for you. If you're not, that can be taken care of right now, today. <laughs> That's good news. You can cry out to the Lord and meet him. You can be born again in a moment's time. Yes. Most of us in here have gone through that. I, I have a concern many times in a church like this for the young people that are in here, that you grow up around this stuff so much you get numb to it. And you hear it and you're going, well, you know, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. It's life and death. Please don't take it for granted. <laughs> Make sure that you know the Lord. Don't just play games. You can fool people. You can fool your parents probably, but not the Lord. Don't play there. <laughs> Get right with God. And if that's for you, please do it. Are you ready? That's how I'll leave that today. Get your house in order. May we not enter eternity unprepared. So here's how I'm praying about this. Lord, I'm very grateful that you hear us when we pray. Lord, again, I don't understand how it all works, and I know you hear us before we even ask, your word says, but you still want us to do so. So Lord, teach us to pray, as your disciples asked. Would you please do that in each one of our lives? Show us how to pray in a manner that would be pleasing to you. God, I thank you for your unending grace and your mercy, your forgiveness. I marvel over how you would restore and redeem Manasseh, a wicked, wicked man who killed one, of, killed one of your servants, and yet you restored him and redeemed him. Paul, as we, as we prayed about, that was a willing accomplice to murder, and you turned him into one of your chief servants. God, you amaze me with your grace 
and your mercy and your forgiveness. God, may I extend that to others. May I be not quick to write people off as beyond your help. And may that be especially true for each one of us as we look at ourselves. Sometimes we have a lot more grace towards others and not towards ourselves. But Lord, you love us. You sent your son to die for us. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lord God. God, I thank you for your word. Whether I did a good job or not today with it, it's living and it's active and it's sharp. And I pray we would be people of your word. That we would not listen to the lies of the enemy, but we would test everything according to the standard you've given us, which is your word. Help us to do that, Lord. May we not be just the people that follow wickedness blindly like the people of Manasseh's day. May we be sons and daughters of God who are intimately familiar with your truth and your word. Help us to do that and grow into that, Father. Again, thank you for today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your grace and your life that you've given us. We'll be with people as we go to the next part of our service where we fellowship one with another. Just bless those conversations and give you praise for it. Amen.